Hello there friends and welcome for today's BG3 guide we have a very powerful Blade Warlock and Paladin multi-class build that works for both the main character and of course Will, the classic goody two shoes party member that wants to smite evil on sight. Both of these classes actually have amazing synergy with each other as I'll soon show you and this character in particular will be quite powerful at melee with around 50 normal damage on each strike and even up to 80 plus on your smites. Not counting critical hits of course, which will truly melt the enemies in holy light. For easy one shots. And the best part to me is how many attacks per round you can stack. Just look at our character go, we can get around 12 entire attacks per turn. With many smite evil uses of course, by combining both paladin and warlock spell books. And don't worry, because even without smites, your character will easily be able to destroy enemies, even on tactician mode, of course. Lastly, by virtue of being a warlock, especially for the early game, you'll have easy access to the very powerful Eldritch Blast ability at full scaling for any range concern, including even some nice defensive options, such as the Darkness spell. Last but not least, through a certain piece of gear, whenever you smite the enemy, you'll even create a very nasty area of effect that debuffs the enemy's attack rolls. So without further ado, let us get into our Blade Lock Paladin build, first with character creation. Now as I said, this build can work for both the main character and Will. I'll be using Will here, because I really think it fits him thematically and roleplaying wise, together with his whole background of course. His race is human, which won't do much for this build. If you were playing as the main character, go with for example the Wood half Elf for extra movement, Githyanki for some extra abilities, or the classic Zeriel Tifling for extra smites. But human will do just fine. Now there's two ways you can begin this build, either as a Warlock or a Paladin. The main difference is Paladin at level 1 will provide you with heavy armor proficiency, right? which you cannot gain if you multi-class into Paladin later, it's only gonna be up to medium armor. I don't really think this build in particular needs heavy armor. Well, first because the best heavy armor in the game works regardless of proficiency. Second, there's plenty of powerful medium armors we can use, including one that will debuff the enemy's attack rolls by a stacking amount, that I'll cover later in the gear section. So to me, I'd much rather Warlock first, because I think it makes for a much smoother early game experience. You have your Eldritch Blast, you can easily one-shot enemies by pushing them into the void, and of course you'll gain your packed weapon as early as level 3. But like I said, you can grab one level into Paladin and then continue as a Warlock. For cantrips and spells, please remember that I already have a best spells guide you can check to the side here. So for now, let's just keep it simple. Eldritch Blast, of course, is your main bread and butter ranged ability. Because it's a cantrip, it will fully scale with your total levels, right? It's not Warlock levels, which is pretty strange if you're coming from 3rd edition or Pathfinder. Which means no matter how many levels you have in your Paladin, your Eldritch Blast will remain at full power, right? Great for any range needs you might have with this build. Second Blade Ward, just to grant you full physical resistance on demand if needed, ideally pre-buffed out of battle. Now for Warlock subclass you have two choices. The Fiend is my preferred pick, because its first ability, Dark One's Blessing, is really good. Whenever you kill an enemy, no matter with what, your blast, your melee attacks, it doesn't matter, you'll get temporary hit points. It's only going to be around plus 5 for us, because you won't get many levels into Warlock, but that's good enough to avoid at least one blow, especially early game. Just remember, temporary HP will not stack. Second, you can go with the Great Old One, once again for its level 1 ability, that lets you apply fear on enemies on a critical hit. My issue with this is, for most of the game you won't have very high critical hits chance, right? Although there is a certain Mind Flayer power that lets you have a free critical once per long rest. Still, I'd much rather the Fiend because Dark One's Blessing, well, it's more constant and permanent, right? And for spells, definitely Hex, which can help a lot early game. Later, with a certain feat, you'll have a melee attack as a bonus action, so chances are you won't really be using this anymore. But for the very early sections of the game, it's a must-have to increase damage even further, when you're at your weakest. And the second spell is up to you, pick whatever you want. I'll be going with protection from evil and good. Now, for ability scores and stats, this can also go two different ways. 
Well, first, be sure to dump your intelligence. <laughs> We're the classic big dump paladin, a good boy, nevertheless. Strength is easily dumpable too, because as a blade warlock, we'll get to apply our charisma to both to hit and damage with our weapon attacks, just like our Eldritch Blast. And speaking about charisma, this is where you have two options. You can start with 17 if you're planning on accepting a certain boost at chapter 1 from the Hag boss fight at the swamp area, which will grant you a plus 1 increase to it, so that whenever you level up at let's say level 4, you can make it into 20 already by spending 2 points instead of a feat. Or you know, if you'd rather leave this extra bonus to the main character or someone else, just start with 16 instead, it's not going to make that much of a difference eventually. Because my will is not the main character, this is what I'm gonna do, especially to show you that it's still viable and powerful enough. Now I also like going with 16 dexterity for two main reasons. First, initiative. I absolutely hate acting after the enemies. It is really a big loss of power, you want your alpha strikes to work, because the faster you can dispatch enemies, the better for you, especially when it comes to survivability. Second, since we won't be wearing heavy armor until Act 3, the extra points will help when it comes to medium and light armor AC. But honestly, it's mostly for initiative, and I know some will say, why don't you just use the gloves that set your dexterity to 18? Well, because there are other gloves I want to use with this character instead, for higher damage and so on. 14 constitution is more than enough, and the leftover points are up to you. I like wisdom because it helps with wisdom saving throws. Most of the enemies' annoying crowd control spell effects target your wisdom, like let's say charm. For skill points for either Will or the main character, definitely all of the main dialogue skills, right? After all, we have super high charisma. Intimidation, persuasion, and deception. Well, deception isn't exactly very paladin-like, but well, we can help. Now we want to keep progression into Warlock, until around level 5 for the extra Pact Blade attack. Pick any other spell here, we'll be replacing it at level 3 anyways. For your Eldritch Invocations, this is quite a stack level for Warlock, another reason I prefer to pick the levels earlier, rather than Paladin. You also have two options, well, the first one is a given, Agonizing Blast, you'll definitely want this. To empower your blasts with damage equal to your Charisma modifier, even better for when you start firing multiple blasts, for double or triple the damage starting from level 5 plus. Second, and this is where you have a choice. Repelling Blast if you want to push enemies away from you, which has pretty nice uses, right? It's not just about pushing enemies into the void to one-shot them, but for the ability to push them into dangerous area of effect spells and abilities, right? Like, let's say, well, your Warlock's Darkness itself. Speaking about Darkness, you might choose to forsake Repelling Blast until level 5, and instead go with Devil Sight. Because at level 3 Warlock, we get to cast the Darkness spell. When you cast Darkness on top of yourself, ranged enemies, well, they won't be able to do anything, because they cannot fire into the Darkness Cloud, and as far as melee enemies, they'll become blinded, without a saving throw and any resistance, which means less chances of them hitting you, because they do so at disadvantage, and higher chances of you hitting them instead, with both your blast and also melee attacks fired inside the cloud. It's really quite a powerful combo, especially early on. But well, you might not care for it, because it does interfere with other party members, especially if they are melee. So either agonizing and devil side, or agonizing and repelling blast. You can get the three of them at level 5 anyways. At level 3 we get both our level 2 warlock spells together with our pact ability. Now for spells, Definitely Darkness, as I've mentioned before. And you'll also want to replace a spell for a second one. Lose whatever, so long as it's not Hex, and pick Misty Step. Amazing for, you know, battlefield movement and teleportation. Especially because it is cast as a bonus action. Now, for your Pact, you also have two choices. Pact of the Blade is, of course, is what will make the build work. It's just that, to me, it's not particularly useful until level 5. And by that point, you can just respect your character, right? It's free after all. Because level 5 is when you can attack twice at melee with your packed weapon. To me, I'd much rather Pact of the Chain first, if you're playing this character from the start of the game, of course, so you get the Infamiliar, very powerful early game, for flying and also attacking the enemies. Like I said, just respect into Pact of the Blade at level 5, or well, pick it at level 3 if you prefer. For level 4, any other cantrip, might as well pick friends, and any other spell too. 
Cloud of Daggers can help as far as area of effect, but it does require concentration so it interferes with your darkness ability. Frankly, later you'll just be using the slots for Paladin Smite spells anyways. Now, for your first feat, this can also go a number of different ways. For starters, you can go with Ability Improvement and acquire 18 or even 20, if you started with 17 and got the power up I mentioned before, as this will increase both the power of your Eldritch Blast and melee weapon. But my preferred choice here is actually Great Weapon Master. This is another feat that is absolutely busted for this type of build. Just like the Sharpshooter feat for ranged characters, it will simply increase your melee damage by a static plus 10, which for a game like Baldur's Gate 3 is an absolutely outstanding amount. Second, whenever you score a critical hit or kill the enemy with a melee attack, you'll also get a bonus melee action with full damage at that turn. It's limited to just one per turn, but it's great regardless. Of course, the downside is the same as Sharpshooter, a minus 5 to your attack rolls, but look, there are so many different ways of overcoming this. I'm even planning on soon releasing a guide on how to maximize your hit chance even on tactician mode. But for starters, the blast spell, the darkness spell as a warlock, as I explained before, because it blinds enemies even at melee range, the risky ring for advantage on all attacks, even a pair of gloves you can get as early as Act 1 that provide you with advantage. Like I said, many ways of doing it. Which is why I prefer to pick this earlier, because remember, as soon as you reach level 5, you'll have two melee attacks, together with more from, let's say, the Elixir of Bloodlust, and most importantly, the Haste spell, which becomes available to your spellcasters exactly at this level. At level 5, as I mentioned, we get our second attack, which, by the way, will stack with further attack boosts from Paladin, that you'll get soon enough. And as far as your level 3 spell, my preferred pick here is Hunger of Hadar. First, it's Warlock exclusive, and second, while it does interfere with your melee attacks, right, because it will also damage you at melee, so you might as well just prefer darkness instead, still the effect is quite powerful for crowd-controlling enemies, right? It does damage, it's a huge cloud, just like darkness, will automatically blind enemies, and even does damage at the start and end of their turns if they are inside the cloud, together with making the area difficult terrain so they'll have a hard time moving away. But it's more for a blaster warlock because you can also push enemies back into it through repelling blast. Anyways, it's up to you. You can even go with Hypnotic Pattern for a crowd control, and at the very least this won't interfere with your allies' attacks. You of course want to replace a spell now, might as well pick Cloud of Daggers. Just be sure to keep Hex, Mist, Step and Darkness. And for the second spell, Counter Spell of course, because it can really help prevent enemy spellcasters from, well, doing anything. For the last invocation, either Repelling Blast or Devil's Sight as I mentioned before, and if you went with the Great Old One Warlock, Fiendish Vigor can also help to cast False Life an infinite amount of times for temporary HP. Even Mire the Mind can work if you want to cast Slow, but I'd rather use the slots for Paladin Smites that you'll get at the next level. At level 6 we already got everything from Warlock, so now it's time to finally enter into Paladin. And here's a very fun fact. Your Warlock spell slots can be shared with Paladin for all of the Paladin spells, which means all of the Paladin Smites will work with your Warlock spell slots. Which of course is great because by default, Paladins can only recharge their Smites on a long rest. Meanwhile, Warlocks get to do it on a short rest. Anyways, when it comes to the Paladin Oath, my preferred pick here is Devotion. It's the classic goody to shoes Paladin, perfect for Will. But most importantly for its level 3 ability, which I'll soon get into. Oath of Vengeance, of course, is quite good as well. Just pick one of these. For level 7 and our fighting style, great weapon fighting because at this point we'll be all out into two-handed weapons. You can always grab defense for plus 1 AC, but I'd rather delay this from when we get fighter levels. And of course, we at last get Paladin spells. Honestly, you'll just be using the default smite, because a lot of the other smite abilities, they cost both an action and a bonus action. I personally don't want to waste the bonus action, because through the weapon feat we just got at level 4, remember, we have an extra bonus melee attack at full damage whenever we get a critical or kill an enemy. Therefore, I just spam the normal Divine Smite. Which, by the way, gets higher damage when you upscale with, right? So, it's a win-win. 
But Shield of Faith can be quite useful as well, to increase your AC. This way you leave Blast for your Cleric. At level 3 we get our 3D special Oath of Devotion ability, Sacred Weapon. By spending a channel of charge, which is recharged on short rest, just like your Warlock spells for smiting, you can increase your main weapon's two hit chance equal to your Charisma modifier, right? Which will be plus 4 to plus 5. To me this is way better than Oath of Devotion gets at this level. To ensure you have advantage on your attacks against one enemy, it's just that honestly, increases shoot to hit chance are way more difficult to get in this game than advantage. Like I said, there are so many sources of advantage, Plus, that only works against one enemy. Sacred Weapon is against all targets, and at the duration of 10 turns, it's gonna last for the whole battle, you can easily prep buff with it as well, because you don't wanna spend an action in battle doing it. Sanctuary granted for free can also work as, well, a spell to protect allies or even yourself further, by preventing enemies from targeting you. As far as your feet at level 9, this is when it would increase our charisma at last. But as I said, you can do it at level 4 too, at which point you could even have 20 Charisma already. Level 10 is huge because we get the second attack as a Paladin, which like I said, stacks with Pact of the Blade extra attack. Level 2 Pally spells don't matter much, like I said, you're just spamming the normal smite. Upscaled, that is. Now, at level 11 plus, I'd rather multiclass as well, because we don't get much from a Paladin. Right, so Aura of Protection can be quite handy by increasing the saving throws of yourself and allies around you, you put your Charisma mod, it's just that to me, by the time you get this, it doesn't matter as much. So now it's time to multi-class yet again, with the classic fighter, right, because we get the extra action surge ability for even more attacks. Or you can also pick Druid as two levels of Spore Druid will grant you an extra 1d6 necrotic damage on all attacks. It's just that fighter certainly fits Will way better, right? It doesn't seem to be much of a Druid to me, but like I said, it's up to you. And that's pretty much it for build progression. Well, alright, now let us get into gear for our Holy Warrior Paladin Warlock Will. For the helmet, ultimately I really enjoy Saravok's Horn Helmet, because of the extra boost to critical range, right? And with this type of character, well, you already deal high damage on a normal attack, even higher on smites, then as far as critical smites, you just melt the enemy in Holy Light. However, for Act 1 you can go with the classic Haste Helm to increase your movement speed, but the only other helm that can compare with Seravox for this build is the Diadem of Arcane Synergy. Whenever you inflict a condition, you'll get Arcane Synergy for 2 rounds, which means you'll deal additional damage equal to your spellcasting ability modifier on attacks, which of course is Charisma. The interesting part is, well first, this is way earlier than Seravox helmet, right? It's at the GIF crash, so even Act 1 you can get there. But anyways, triggering this effect is surprisingly easy because pretty much any condition will trigger it, right? I mean, my character by itself just attacking the enemy already triggers it. So go with either Seravox for higher critical or the Diadem for higher damage. For cloaks, well, since you'll be meleeing, you might as well use the Cloak of Protection for plus 1 to AC and saves, or you know, just leave it to a fully dedicated tank like my Shadowheart tank build. Otherwise, just the Cloak of Displacement once again for extra chances of avoiding enemy attacks. It's certainly better than the Cloak of Protection. For armor you have a few different options as well. Ultimately, if you want the highest AC possible, the Hell Dusk armor, right? Because as I said in the beginning of this video, it doesn't matter if you don't have proficiency with it, it will automatically work without any penalty. Not exactly a very paladin looking armor though. Anyways, you also have the medium armors that don't have a dexterity cap on AC, right? Such as the armor of agility or the UNT armor earlier. This one definitely seems to be befitting a holy warrior. Now, my preferred pick, however, is the luminous armor Man, this armor is just... I mean, I gotta laugh because it's quite overpowered. It's broken, really. First, you can get it quite early, at Act 1, as opposed to all the other armors I mentioned. But its special ability, Radiating Shockwave, it's out of this world, right? Whenever you deal Radiant damage, 
you'll cause a radiant shockwave. And this radiant damage can come from whatever, right? Smites, normal attacks, spells. It will apply the very nasty radiating orb debuff on all enemies in a 3 meter radius. And get this, it stacks, right? Each stack of radiating orb means the enemy now has minus 1 to attack rolls. Considering you can eventually apply, what, minus 9 to minus 10 by just attacking the enemy, they are doomed to failing their attacks regardless of how high or low your AC is. Especially bosses who tend to live way longer, so they get even higher stacks of this. It's found at a Selenite outpost in the Underdark, right? So even Act 1, because there are many ways of reaching the Underdark in this game. Of course, the major downside is it has less AC than the other armors I mentioned. But well, if you're debuffing the enemy's attack rolls with such high amounts anyways, it's not like it's gonna matter that much. So the choice is up to you. For gloves, ultimately held dusk, right, for the extra fire damage on hit, but earlier, especially for Act 1, be sure to go with the gloves of the underdog, because their effect is quite stacked, so long as you are surrounded by two or more foes, always if you're going to be at melee range anyways, all of your attacks will be made with advantage, busted good, especially to compensate for the penalty of our weapon master feat, right? For boots, just the evasive shoes for higher AC or, well, leave it to your main tank. For talismans, there's not that many great ones for this build, I'm afraid. Just a classic amulet of greater health later for a very nice increase to constitution and hit points. But another amulet that really stands out is the Pearl of Power. Once again, it's also quite early, like the Luminous Armor Act 1 in the Underdark at the Myconid Colony, and its effect is quite powerful. You get to restore one spell slot up to level 3 for free per long rest, which of course has amazing synergy with the fact we kept out on level 3 Warlock spells, which means an extra level 3 smite eventually. It's just that once you use this ability, you won't have to keep this amulet equipped anymore. For rings, I really like the Strange Conduit for extra psychic damage, 1 to 4. Whenever concentrating on a spell, very easy to do as a Warlock or even Paladin, right? Because you have Shield of Faith and so on. And I really like stacking weapon damage to the max with multiple sources. Together with, well, the Risky Ring, of course, to generate advantage so that we free the Glove slot. Or extra sources of damage, especially the Colos Glow Ring for 2 points of Radiant. Amazing to combine with the Luminous Armor. Or the classic... Caustic Band for a plus 2 acid damage. Considering we have what, 12 attacks? That's 24. Now let's get into weapons and consumables. And my preferred pick is the Hellbeard Halberd. Because I do think this is the weapon that has the highest amount of static damage per hit. 6 whole points of poison damage. Other weapons are usually just 1 to 4, some 1 to 6, but nothing as big as this. And of course we combine it with other fun sources of rainbow damage, if you know what I mean. Don't forget you can make any weapon into your packed weapon. Now there's a lot of other options as well. For example, the legendary Baldurin's Giant Slayer, and you can combine this with Elixirs of Strength or the Gloves of 23 Strength, right, for a higher damage. The Githyanki Silver Sword. And earlier in the game, well, it's mostly your Eldritch Blast and any weapon you find converted into a packed weapon. There's the classic Everburn Blade, right? The earliest of the best two-handed weapons you can find. And honestly, I have a very soft spot for the Skin Buster. Because of its special ability, Skin Buster Force. Whenever you deal melee damage with this weapon, you'll get two turns of Force Conduit, which means you'll take two points less damage. By stacking this, you can highly reduce the damage you take, especially when combined with, let's say, Blade Ward, because they do have synergy together. Ultimately, it's just a Hellbeard anyways. As far as ranged weapons, since we already have our Blast, just a classic dead shot, right? Because we want the extra boost to critical range, so that our smites are even deadlier. And as far as consumables, honestly, it's mostly going to be the Elixir of Bloodlust. If you really wanna stack attacks to the max, as far as the number you can make per turn, this is the way to go. Well, alright friends, so this was it for my main character and will, Paladin Warlock, Holy Wire build guide. If you found it useful, as always, please remember to like, subscribe, and also consider becoming a channel member if you can. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for watching, see you next time, friends.